Good morning and welcome to the morning service here at Open Door Baptist Church. It's good to see each of you here this morning. And as we prepare for our morning service today, uh, we're going to do something a little different. As yesterday was the 20th anniversary of 9-11, a day where some of us here this morning weren't even born. And the events of 9-11 are more of a history event. But for a majority of us here this morning, we can remember exactly where we were on that day. What were we doing? What we were doing when we heard about the terrorist attacks on our country. And we can also remember the amazing sense of patriotism and of unity immediately following those terrorist attacks. And this morning, as we begin our service, I'd like to first of all begin with the pledge to the flag of the United States of America. And then immediately following that, we're going to have a short video presentation that was put together by evangelist Chris Miller, who was with us for our last revival in the spring. And it's the story of one of the rescuers who went in on that day of 9-11 and helped rescue the last two survivors. It's, it's got a very powerful message to it. And I, I hope our, our team saw it yesterday at the youth conference, but I know that it'll be a blessing. As a matter of fact, in your bulletin is a little card, and that card is actually you can use to share this video. There's a QR code on it, and you can uh, give that to someone. They can scan it, and it'll bring it right up on their phone, and they can watch it. But if you would please join me in standing as we pledge to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with life and justice for all. Thank you. You may have a seat. David Carnes walked toward the place where the Twin Towers once stood. The whole atmosphere was surreal. Firefighters warned him, you'll die if you go in there. In spite of the risk, he continued on, begging God to let him rescue any survivors. What happened next was truly miraculous. Please join me as we remember the 9-11 attacks. In the next few minutes, you'll hear the incredible untold story of Marine Staff Sergeant David Carnes and how the last two survivors from 9-11 were rescued. Well, I went to work early that morning, Chris. I, I used to work at the World Financial Center complex right across the street, but you know, by God's grace, he transferred me up a couple months earlier to my firm's national headquarters in Wilton, Connecticut. That's where I was that morning, and my phone rang. My sister had called me from Pittsburgh saying that the second tower was engulfed. Uh, she watched a, a jetliner fly right into the tower. We want to tell you what we know as we know it, but we just got a report in that there's been some sort of explosion at the World Trade Center in New York City. Another plane has just hit, it hit another building. Hi, baby. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I love you. Realizing America was under attack. Carnes jumped in his Porsche 911, retrieved his marine utilities, got a quick marine haircut, gathered necessary gear, then made one more stop. I, I got my gear out of storage in Valley Stream and, and Bible Baptist Church is maybe two miles away. And I went over there and as soon as I pulled up to the church, Pastor Barker was outside on the sidewalk. Pastor Barker said, Brother Dave, he says, you're going down there, aren't you? And I says, yes, I am, Pastor. He said, I, I knew you would. And I said, yeah, Pastor, can we, can we please pray? And, and I got out of the car and we went to God in prayer, you know, that God would guide me and protect me. And I jumped back in the car and, and, I, and I raced towards uh, the World Trade Center, Lower Manhattan. The Twin Towers on the south end, the two of them were very prominent on this. They, made, they dwarfed everything else in that skyline and they were gone. I looked over and I was asking God I, I was trying to envision like 
what it was like in those buildings because I had worked in those. And it, it, it kind of broke my heart, you know, thinking about what it's like in those buildings. What's the, the what's the mood and the environment oh, at the I moment? Is it, it's I not mean, hard to imagine. It, it, it's close to you, and you you see what the impact must have been like, and you see the kind of devastation that uh, has, has uh, incurred by, by the buildings, and it's just uh, it's it's, uh, it's just frightening, is uh, perhaps even too mild a word. Okay. Um, it's absolutely uh, just a, a horrible, horrible sight. I said, God, if it means my life today. Please use me to help anybody that needs help down there. This was all like engulfed with smoke and fires were raging in here. So it was, it was not, it didn't look like this. It was very surreal. Did you say it'd be gray all over? Or? It was, yeah, it was like a, a grayish coating of everything. Just papers, blanket it. Papers everywhere, pieces of the Trade Center building, steel everywhere. Well, tell us about this spot right here, what took place. I, I walked down Vesey Street here, Chris. I, that's some military guys just down the road there, it, and one of them was a Marine sergeant. I asked him to come with me, and we walked down here, and when we got to this point, there was about uh, 15, 20 FDNY firefighters that were standing. Near Building 7? Building 7's right down the middle of this block here. It had just collapsed uh, minutes before, and uh, these guys had backed off and they were just standing here, and I, I went up to the, the one fireman, and I, I said, to your knowledge, has anybody been conducting search and rescue operations in the epicenter of the Trade Center complex? And he said, no, Marine. If you go, if you go in there, you're gonna die. It's unstable, there's explosions, it's on fire, the buildings are collapsing, Tower 7 just collapsed. The Millennium Hotel is in imminent danger of collapsing next. We actually walked down the street, and. The doors were wide open. The hotel had been abandoned. And that's a fancy hotel. Like, it was weird just seeing the doors left open like that. But that just shows you how the urgency of people leaving that building. I mean, we were looking at a, a thick wall of smoke across the street. And then all of a sudden, uh, it just opened up. The, the circle it just grew bigger and bigger. The, the sun was setting a bright orange, and it silhouetted the World Financial Center where I used to work. Then the smoke just closed. It's like God opened it up so we could see what we were up against. And, and it was just total devastation. I had yelled out, uh, United States Marines, uh, we can hear you, yell louder. I hadn't heard them, but I just wanted to encourage them in case they were, and they, sure enough, they heard me and we started, Sergeant Thomas and I heard muffled, muffled cries coming from, from this area, the South Tower. And the, when the building collapsed, it had created a huge crater and a rim of steel around it. And they were just right before that rim of steel, at the edge of the crater, about 20, 20 feet buried underneath the, the, the steel. I, I pulled out my cell phone and I, I said another prayer to God I said, God, I know cell phones aren't working in New York City right now. I said, but please let this call go through. And I called my wife and she picked up on like the second ring. And I told her, honey, I'm in the World Trade Center. For her to call the NYPD Command Operations Center when she hung up with me. And I used that sphere as a reference point. I said, if you enter from Church Street, head towards the fountain, You'll see this the centerpiece of the fountain sitting on top of the steel and then bang south about 20 yards and, and you'll see us. After about 15, 20 minutes, the first guy showed up and that was Chuck Sereka, a, a paramedic, former paramedic, and just what we needed. And we jumped in the hole. We were right next to Wilhelmino and we couldn't see him. And I'm shining this little light and he's like, I'm right here and right here. And he's getting all frustrated. And we're like, we can't see you. Like, finally, he said, wiggle your fingers. and. And even then it took a couple minutes. And then finally I shine my light and I see this little gray, wow. a gray finger surrounded by gray, like going like that. And I said, ah, oh, we got you, we got you. God sent the right guy at the exactly the right time, but he didn't have a radio. Nobody knew he was in there. I said, God, send somebody here, maybe NYPD that has a radio. I no sooner shut out that prayer, maybe five, 10 minutes later, 
two NYPD cops jump into the hole. They were emergency service unit cops, ESU cops. They're highly skilled in extricating people from building collapses, which is exactly what we're dealing with. And they jump in the hole and they got a radio. So they call out to the, to the police, NYPD, as they're trying to dig them out and we're waiting for the other people to bring the gear that we had requested, the fire started encroaching at Will Jimeno's feet. And they were getting pretty bad, pretty intense. Patty McGee, the NYPD cop, he grabbed Dominic Pozzola's jacket, one of the dead police officers, and he was like using it to beat out the flames. And it wasn't working. And they said, we got to abort, abort, abort. And they were going to leave. And I, I said, no, no, no. I said, we're not leaving. And I, I shot out a prayer. I said, God, I know you're not going to let it end this way. You brought us this far. I said, please send somebody now to put out these fires. The moment I, I, I got done with that prayer, it seemed like Tommy Asher, FDNY, jumps into the hole and he's got this big clunky metal fire extinguisher and he opens up and he puts out the fire. We got to a point where Scott Strauss said that, that's right, I gotta cut this beam here, but if I cut it, the whole, everything above us is gonna come down on us. He said, but I can't get him out unless I cut it. I said, well then cut it, Scotty. If, if, if it goes, we all go together. But I shot out a prayer and I said, God, let it hold, everything hold, and, and so we can get this guy out. So he cut the beam and it didn't come down. The day after 9-11 on September 12th, I left the pile down here and the sheriffs drove me up to Bellevue Hospital where the two police officers were in the trauma unit there. I guess word got out inside to the wives of the two officers that the Marine that rescued their husbands was there. And the doors opened up and these two women came running up to me and hugged me. <laughs> and they threw their arms around me and thanked me and were kissing my neck. And just then I realized that this is my reward. You know, to have those two women thank me for saving their husbands' lives. That uh, was, that meant a lot to me. You're in the middle of a tragedy, you're focused. You know, I was a Marine and I, on a mission from God, I was just focused on stuff and the whole time, the whole eight days. And then I, I left and my wife and I visited the two cops and we're walking out of the hospital seeing all these posters. I started reading them. I just lost it, you know? That's when I kind of first hit home about what had happened. I thought there was probably a, a greater than 90% chance that I would not survive the day. And I was okay with that. I was at peace with that. Why were you okay with that? Because I knew that I was saved. And I, I had that blessed assurance of my salvation. If you died, you knew why. I, the Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord, I would immediately be in heaven. God used me on September 11, 2001 to save the, the lives of two police officers here at the World Trade Center. But a few months prior to that, I trust that Jesus Christ is my own Savior. Jesus Christ, God's Son, left heaven to rescue us. Jesus came to save the world and to save you. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. When the Bible speaks of being saved, it is referring to being rescued from our sin and its judgment of death. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible explains the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Once a person dies, their soul continues somewhere forever, either heaven or hell. When Christ died in your place, all of your sin was placed upon him, and he died on the cross. But three days later, he proved that he was God by raising again. He's the only one who can rescue you because he's the only one without sin. I was trying to make myself a better person, and someday I'll be, I'll be worthy and I'll ask God to save me. But you had to realize that you couldn't save yourself, and Jesus is the only one that could save you. Exactly. I realized that I, I would never be able to make myself worthy for salvation. So what is the main thing we need to realize before we can be rescued from our sin? We all need to call out to God in faith to be rescued. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You need to call out to God in faith. Will you, right now, call out to God in faith? You know, I would just urge people to not put it off. 
9-11 showed us, Chris, uh, there's no guarantee for tomorrow. Will you trust Jesus to save you right now? You can call out to God in a simple prayer. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you, but I believe that Jesus died in my place for my sin. I am now trusting Jesus alone to save me and to give me eternal life in heaven. Amen. If you did just trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You can now say that you have been rescued. For more information, please visit rescued911.com. And may God bless you. Several people asked me uh, this morning, so where were you on 9-11? And, and I, can, I can remember very vividly, and I'm thankful that I can also remember. It's not necessarily the details of where I was when I was rescued from my sins and trusted Christ as my personal Savior, but I do remember that there was a day. And if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, there is a God in heaven who loves you and who wants to rescue you from your sins and from condemnation and hell for all of eternity. And uh, just as Evangelist Miller shared on that presentation, it's just as simple as putting your faith and trust in God, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, and asking him to save you. Uh, I hope that you'll take the, uh, the track and uh, that you'll pass it out. It, it looks like this. It's in your bulletin. There's more on the back table as you leave. And it's just that simple QR code on the back. People can use their camera and scan it. Or they can go to the website. Great evangelistic tool. Uh, just by way of uh, praise, it was three, Sunday, three Sundays ago today that two children who rode our church van um, after junior church prayed to trust Christ as their personal Savior. They were rescued from their sin, and now they have the gift of eternal life. And that, folks, is what we're here for, is to see people rescued from their sins and then to help them grow in their relationship and their walk with the Lord. This morning in our service, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper communion service, and so the songs and the message will be uh, geared toward that. Our first song this morning is page number two. If you're using your hymn books, Glory to His Name. If you're able to stand, please stand with me as we sing Glory to His Name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within, there at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. We'll continue with that great singing, page number four, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. We'll sing the first, second, and third stanzas. I 
must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of life if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. I must needs go in the blood sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights of life, where the soul is at home with God. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Then I bid farewell to the ways of the world, to walk in and nevermore. For my Lord says, come, and I seek my home, where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Brother Jeffrey, if you could open us in a word of prayer, please. Thank you. You may have a seat. Uh, just a few reminders from the bulletin. Uh, our midweek service is on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. And then uh, beginning this week on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays at 10 a.m. We'll have church visitation. So if you'd like to come and uh, pass out tracts or John and Romans or even just come and prepare those things, um, we'll be meeting right here at 10 a.m. and then be, being going out. Um, consistently on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And so if that works with your schedule, we'd love to have you. Uh, coming up on the 25th of September, that's a Saturday at 8.30 a.m., we'll be having a men's breakfast. There is a sign-up on the back table in the foyer, and it, it's a little misleading. The picture looks like a sunset, but if you look carefully, you'll actually see that the sun is a yolk from an egg, and the hills are actually bacon, so it's very misleading, but it's to help you sign up uh, for the, that's, that's a hint for whoever's cooking breakfast, eggs and bacon uh, for us. But that'll be on September 25th, and then next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll have our missions banks as we prepare for our missions conference uh, the first weekend in November, and looking forward to that. We'll continue with our singing. If you're using your hymn books, uh, page number 15 Lead me to Calvary. You can remain seated as we sing. Hang on one second. Let me get to the right. There we go. Lead me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. 
Show me the tomb where thou wast slain, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Led me like Mary through the gloom, come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Then our last hymn, page 19, There is a Fountain. a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may i though vile as he wash all my sins away wash all my sins away Wash all my sins away, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power, till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more, till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Aren't you looking forward to that day when we will be in his presence and we will be completely saved from sin. Be saved to sin no more. Certainly will be a blessed day. Have Adrian Adrian come for our offering this morning. And as the Lord has blessed you, I pray that you'll be faithful to give back to him um, in your tithes and offerings. Uh, Brother Adrian, if you can ask a blessing on the offering, please.
you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This time, out the back doors, we'll dismiss Junior Church uh, with Mrs. Warner. So out the back doors, uh, Junior Church, all of our children. The rest will be 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we focus um, on the Lord's Supper this morning and communion service. Beginning in verse Number 23, the Apostle Paul says to the church of Corinth, For I have received the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. At the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. We are forgetful people. And the Lord knew that. And that's why he instituted the Lord's Supper for the apostles, for the early church, and for us today to remember what Christ has done for us. And so today we gather together as a body of believers here at Open Door Baptist Church to follow the Lord's command and to remember him. There are three places in the Bible that we're going to take a look at this morning that are going to be the focus for our remembering. Three locations, three cities, and each, or three places, three locations, and each one of these locations was a place that we can remember the suffering of Jesus Christ. If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, here we have the place of Gethsemane. We have that wonderful hymn that we sing in the garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. He walks with me. He talks with me. And what a wonderful um, truth that hymn conveys. But in all actuality, yes, the place of the Garden of Gethsemane was a place of prayer and communication, but it was also a place of great suffering for our Savior. Matthew 26, beginning verse 36, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them, and went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to the disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doeth, doth betray me. And you can hear the words of suffering of our Savior Jesus Christ as he prays to his Father, as he communicates with his disciples. Gethsemane was a place of suffering. At Gethsemane, Christ suffered at the hand of Satan. He felt the full impact of Satan's attack in Gethsemane. Now, throughout human history and Bible history, Satan has attacked over and over and over again. The nation of Israel, Satan tried to attack in the killing of all the baby boys in Egypt. In Jerusalem, Herod tried to attack by killing all the boys under the age of two. And here in Gethsemane, oh, if only Satan could get Christ to die, even of a heavy heart, to keep him from shedding his blood. Back in Matthew 4, 4, we see that, uh, back, back in Matthew chapter 4, and also in Luke chapter 4, we see the temptation of Christ, how Christ was led of, of the Spirit into the wilderness, and he was tempted of the devil for 40, year, 40 days. Uh, after that, it says in verse 13 in Luke 4, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. But perhaps the greatest attack of Satan was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Even as Christ was battling and praying with his father, saying, 
Lord, if there's any other way for the redemption of mankind to take place than me dying on the cross, me being separated from you, me bearing the sin of mankind, let it be so, but not my will, but yours be done. Mark 14, 33, it talks about how as he took Peter, James, and John, that he was sore amazed and began to be very heavy. The word sore amazed means to be struck with amazement. Matthew 26, 37, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. The word very heavy means to be full of heaviness. In verse 38 of Matthew 26, then saith Peter, that my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Christ was surrounded by grief to the degree that his very life was threatened. But through all this, Christ was victorious, even suffering in Gethsemane. Luke twenty two forty three, 43, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. The father knew his son and knew the difficulty he was facing and sent, some, sent an angel to strengthen him. And regardless of where you are right now, Regardless of the suffering that you are faced, it may be physical suffering, it may be emotional suffering, it may be relational suffering, uh, it may be a thorn in the flesh, whatever it is, we can be encouraged, as it says in Hebrews 4.15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. We have a Savior who suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. He felt the full impact of Satan's attack there in Gethsemane. But also, Christ there in Gethsemane, he felt the full impact of sin's curse. The curse that came upon Adam and Eve's choice to sin back in Genesis chapter 3. And all the sins of mankind up to that point and into the future, Christ knew that he would bear the impact of sin's curse upon mankind. The name Gethsemane literally means an oil pressed. And it was there in the garden that Christ was pressed not only by the devil, but by the thoughts of paying the penalty of the sins of all mankind for all of eternity. And yet, he was victorious, even being willing to be submissive to his father and his father's plan. In Matthew 26, we see Gethsemane. Please turn with me to John 19. John 19, we find our last two places where we will think about and considering the suffering of Christ as we prepare for our time of communion. John chapter 19, beginning in verse number 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate there, therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto him, Behold, the man. When the chief priest, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he hath made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power of all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivereth me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against the Caesar. Then verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat him down in the judgment seat. And it is a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. First of all, we saw Gethsemane, and now we see Gabbatha, the place where Christ was tried before Pilate. Matthew 26, verse 45 says, Then cometh he to his disciples and saith to them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. 
Gabbatha is a place that is associated with the sufferings of Jesus at the hands of sinful men. We see that he was despised and rejected of men. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Think about the suffering at the hands of sinners, culminating here in Gabbatha, but even leading up from the Garden of Gethsemane into Gabbatha. Christ there in the Garden of Gethsemane was betrayed by Judas, and he was deserted by all of his disciples. In Luke 22, we see that Christ was beaten by the temple guards. In Matthew 27 and John 1, we see that he was rejected by the very people that he came to save. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. In Matthew 27, he was scourged. Also here in John 19, we see that he was scourged as the cat of nine tails was brought upon his open back time and time and time again. They took a crown of thorns and put upon his head and beat it down with a reed. Christ suffered at the hands of sinful men. He was mocked by the soldiers as he was crowned with thorns and even put a robe upon his back. Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 6, it was prophesied that his very beard would be plucked from his face. In John 19 verses 13 through 16, we see that he was condemned to die. Gabbatha was a place where Christ suffered at the hands of sinful men. It was a place where he was despised and rejected of men. But yet, at Gabbatha, in Gethsemane, Christ endured all of that suffering. Why? Because of you and I. Because of all mankind. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And in just a few moments, we'll have a, a piece of bread and some juice that we will have the opportunity to partake of. And it's in this time of remembrance, remembering the suffering of Christ, that we remember that he suffered at the hands of sinful men. We remember that he was despised, that he was rejected. That he took the full attack of Satan there in the Garden of Gethsemane. That he even submitted to the Father's will, knowing what would soon take place. And he did this all because he loved you and I. I feel almost like we don't remember him enough. We don't remember the suffering. You know, it's been 20 years since 9-11 that happened in the terrorist attacks on our country of America. And how many people have forgotten? How many people from the new generation don't even know what happened? And how tragic and how sad that is that people have forgotten and and you think about the, the sense of patriotism and unity, regardless of what party affiliation, there was common grounds. There was unity across the aisles in the fight against, uh, against terrorism, a, a renewed sense of patriotism. How much more tragic it is for you and I as Christians on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday of this upcoming week to forget all about what Christ has done for us. To live our life with no regard for what Christ has done for us. For that great gift of salvation that he has offered us, and, and yet we get so busy with our own agenda, with our own schedules. You know, I did my time Sunday morning. I'm good for the rest of the week, Lord. I even had communion. And yet we forget him in the workplace. We forget him in our conversations with our friends or with our family members. We forget him in the decisions that we make. 
how sad it is that people have forgotten and don't remember 9-11. But worse is a tragedy where Christians forget what Christ has done for them. And that's why we have the Lord's Supper. That's why we have a time of communion where we can remember what Christ has done for us and, and be renewed and be cleansed to where we can go forth and live a life that is pleasing the Lord, to live a life that we show his death until he come back. We've seen the Garden of Gethsemane. We've seen in Gabbatha. And lastly, we have Golgotha. While on the cross, Christ suffered at the hands of sovereignty, of his heavenly Father, of your father and my father, because that was the only way that we could be redeemed from our sins. In John 19, verses 13 through 16. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was a preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him, Pilate saith unto them. Shall I crucify your king? And the chief of the priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away, bearing his cross, but then struggling underneath the load. Simon of Cyrene was compelled, commanded to take the cross beam and to carry it for Christ. There upon Golgotha, upon the place of the skull, upon Calvary, they laid Christ down upon those beams and nailed those stakes into his hands and into his feet. They took that cross and they dropped it in the hole, dislodging the joints of his arms and of his legs. It is said that in order to breathe, the, the individual that was being crucified would have to raise themselves up on that stake through their feet to exhale and to inhale. On the cross, you could hear Christ suffering. Yes, he had suffered at the hand of Satan. He had suffered at the hands of sinners. But now God Almighty is pouring the sins of all mankind upon his own precious son so that we could have redemption. It was there that Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was there that he said to Mary, Behold thy son, and to John, he said, Behold thy mother. It was there that he said to the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It was there that while that three-hour time period where the clouds were darkened and the earth quaked and God the Father was pouring the wrath and the payment and the penalty and the judgment of the sins of all mankind upon his own precious Son, for the first time in human, human, of, of human history, of eternity, Jesus Christ is actually separated from his Father for the first time ever because he has the sins of all mankind upon him. That Christ paying our eternal hell, paying our eternal penalty and damnation in hell, cried out the words, I thirst. But at the end of that time period, well, just before that, he cried out, Lama, Lama Sabathani, which is to be interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he cried out the final words, It is finished. Into thine hands I commit my spirit. And then he died. Gethsemane, he suffered at the hands of Satan, as Satan did his best attempt. For Christ to die without dying upon the cross. But the Father ministered to him. At Gabbatha, he suffered at the hands of sinners. He was despised and rejected. And at Golgotha, he suffered because the Heavenly Father, the Sovereign One, the Holy One, the Just One, poured out judgment upon his own precious Son that we might have forgiveness of sins. And in just a few moments, when the elements are passed, we'll have that little piece of bread, which represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken on behalf 
and then we'll have that juice. And as we drink that juice, it symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for our sins. And we do this in remembrance of him. For as often as we do that, we show his death until he comes back. This service, as we prepare for our communion, let's spend some time remembering Christ at Gethsemane, Christ at Gabbatha, and Christ at Golgotha. Father, I pray that you would now take these next few moments of just quiet remembering and work whatever the need is in our hearts. It may be a need of thankfulness. It may be a need for confession of sin. Whatever the need is, Father, would we remember Gethsemane, Gabbatha, and Golgotha, and our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the suffering that he went through. I pray these things in Christ, and with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to encourage you. We're just going to take a few moments to remember, then I'll come back and we'll um, observe the elements of our communion service. Father God, we're so thankful that you chose to fit in your infinite wisdom to leave us an ordinance to practice together as a body of believers this morning to remember what Christ has done for us. And just as you left the bow in the cloud to remind us that you'd never destroy the earth again with a flood, so you've given us this communion service to remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. His great sacrifice, a time of remembrance, a time of cleansing, a time of joy as we look forward to your soon return. I pray that you bless now as we partake in Christ's name. I'd like to uh, share with you just a few instructions before we observe the elements. Uh, for some of you, this may be your first time for our communion service here at Open Door. We usually have it um, every other month. 
and usually in the evening service, but we were having it in our morning service this morning. Um, today, in just a few moments, I'm going to have uh, Scott and Ted come forward, and uh, we'll pray for each of the elements. Um, we have uh, the elements are um, all in one <laughs> today, uh, so it's completely sanitary, and uh, they're not going to pass the plates. They're just going to walk with the plates. So if if you know Christ as your personal Savior, and you're walking in obedience to Him, you you have your sins confessed. Um, we invite you to partake, and and obviously, if if you may not feel comfortable with even even the way we've prepared it, we certainly understand, and so no one's you're not forced to, but we just like to give you that opportunity. So as they walk by, kind of like the offering, they'll make it available, and if you'd like to, then just kind of reach for it, and they'll they'll hand you they won't hand you the plate, but they'll um, put it to where you can reach and you can pick out your own um, communion thing. And after they serve the elements. Um, we'll all partake together, and so we'll take off, there's two layers, so we'll take off the first layer where the bread is and partake, and then we'll take the second layer off and partake of the juice. So if I could have Scott and Ted come at this time, we'll prepare uh, to serve the elements and remembering what Christ has done for us. God, if you could go ahead and pass the blessing on the bread, which pictures the body and blood of Christ that was broken for our sins. for the bread, if you go ahead and do that. I'd like to read a few verses, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me, in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Brother Ted, if you could pass the blessing on the juice, which represents the blood of Christ.
After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Remembrance of Christ. As Christ and the disciples left the upper room, they sang a song, probably more than one song, uh, but we'll close our service with singing just that chorus, For God So Loved the World. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son to die on Calvary Street, from sin to set me free. Someday he's coming back, what glory that will be. Wonderful his love to me. Lord bless you. Have a great afternoon.